The Lord's given me a really a word today, and I'm excited to preach it um, about pressing in. So uh, today, if you don't know what pressing in means, we're going to figure it out as we go. Maybe some of you need to press in today. Maybe you've never pressed in like today. God's going to show you how to press in. But we've been doing this series called Stay the Course. And I'm telling you, it's, it's with all that's going on in the world, all that's going on in your, in your personal lives, that this strange virus has come in and, and put people out of work and changed the way we think about a lot of things. With all this going on, all the storms that happen in your life, the enemy is always trying to knock us off course. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He wants us to stay on course. Last week, this, this message really dovetails into last week about our destiny because God's got a destiny for every one of us. And if we're going to reach that destiny, we have to have the ability to stay the course. And the enemy's trying to knock us off course, so God wants us to get back on course. He wants us to stay in that straight and narrow way. It's not a broad way. That one leads to destruction, the Bible says. But he wants us to stay the course that he has charted out for you. So this morning, I want you to uh, engage with me this morning because we're going to talk about staying the course and pressing in. Because no matter what the desire is uh, that the enemy has, the greater desire should be for you to have live out God's will in your life, his perfect plan, his destiny for your life. That's God's purpose for your life. And so this is the time, this is the time that we're going to have to learn to step it up, step up our game, so to speak, and to press in. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking from two Gospels today, the same story, two Gospels, but they tell a little bit a different story from each angle. So we're going to be looking at Luke 8 and Mark 5. If you have your Bibles, you want to go ahead and mark that, Luke 8 and Mark 5. I want to be reading from the Passion Translation, some other translations along the way that will help, help uh, filter through and show us some things maybe that we didn't see through the Passion Translation. But I want to set the stage. I'm going to read verse 40 and set the stage for it. When Jesus... A return to Galilee, the crowds were overjoyed, for they had been waiting for him, for Jesus to arrive. Now, at this point, this is early on in Jesus' ministry, and he is already, man, he's already raising the dead. He's already healing the sick. He's already driving out demons. He is doing miracle after miracle, and the word is getting out that this man can teach. This rabbi, this new kid in town, the new rabbi in town, so to speak, he's saying things that we've never heard before. And so they're, the crowds are starting to amass, they're starting to gather, and wherever they hear, oh, I think Jesus is coming to town, they are coming in droves to find him. They wanted to hear him, they wanted to see him, they wanted to touch him, they wanted, to, they wanted the, the miracles to come to their town. So he's coming to their town, it says he returned to Galilee. And the, the crowds, it says, they were overjoyed for they had been waiting for him to arrive. Can you imagine, have you ever waited for something so you were like, man, I can't wait for this to happen. A party or a birthday or, or, or a Christmas or something. You say, I can't wait for this to happen. A graduation. I, I've been working so hard. I'm ready for this to happen. And that's what, that's what the people, they're so excited. They're waiting for Jesus to show up. And it says in verse 41, Just then a man named Jairus, the leader of the local Jewish congregation, fell before Jesus' Jesus's feet. And listen to this. He desperately, say desperately, he desperately begged him to come and heal his 12-year-old daughter, his only child, that's important because she was at the point of death. And Jesus started to go with him to his home to see her, but a large crowd surrounded him. He is pressed in on every side. And you've got one man, my daughter is dying. Would you come to my house? I know you can do something. Jesus coming. So Jesus is like, yeah, I'll be there. But can you see I'm a little busy right now? I can't even get out of this crowd. So. That is one story, and we're not going to focus on that. I just want you to see that he was desperate, because we're going to talk about desperation this morning. He desperately begged Jesus to come to his house. What parent wouldn't? What parent wouldn't? If, if you had a child, it didn't matter what age they are, but if you have a child and, and they're on their deathbed, you're, you're desperate. Nothing else has worked, so you're, going to, you're desperate for Jesus to come to your house, right? Listen, this morning he's coming to your house. I believe with all my heart he's going to come uh, manifest. But the presence of God is going to come into the homes uh, of the people that are watching this morning or they're going to watch it later. They're, he's going to come in and he's going to do some things today that you haven't seen him do before. Are you all ready for that? Because I am. Look at verse 43. In the crowd that day was a woman who had suffered greatly for 12 years from, Jesus, from slow bleeding. Even though she had spent all she had on healers, she was still suffering. 
The first thing I want you to see this morning is what desperation does. Just like Jairus, Jairus, this, this, this woman was indeed, she was in deep uh, suffering. She was in a, a desperate condition. Listen, when you start studying what the conditions that she really was in, this bleeding, it wasn't like the once a month bleeding. This was like a disease. She, would have, she bled all the time. And listen, if in, the, in that culture of that day and in the laws of that day, if you had a, a bleeding disorder, you were called unclean. You couldn't go to worship. You can do so many things that everybody else was doing because you were unclean. And then she had to go through ritual after rit ritual of ceremonial cleansing. And listen, if you even, if she sat down in some place and then you came and sat where she sat, you were unclean. You talk about an embarrassing life that she lived. And this wasn't just for a few weeks of isolation. This was for 12 years this was going on in her life. She was suffering. She was tormented. She was embarrassed. And she wanted desperately to get healed from that disease, from that blood disorder. You talk about social distancing. She wasn't supposed to be in the crowd that day. She wasn't supposed to be around people that day, much less touch Jesus that day. And we talk about separating, and she said, man, there's no, nothing. Nothing's going to keep me from getting to him today. I, I'm asking you this morning, what are you desperate for? What is in your life that you are so desperate for a touch from God? that you will, you will risk going out and doing some things that maybe you've never done before. Desperation will cause you to do that. In the Gospel of Mark, verse 26, 526, it said, She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors, yet in spite of spending all she had on her treatments, she was not getting better but worse. That's even, that's even more, dis uh, uh, makes you more distraught to think about that. I'm spending money. Uh, every doctor, I've went to every specialist. I've taken every medication. I've tried the new uh, medications. They're not working. I I've done this. I've done that. I I'm listening to this doctor. I'm trying the homeopath. I'm trying the medicinal. I'm trying everything. And nothing's working. Matter of fact, I'm getting worse. She's desperate. Desperate. All of her money's gone. That might be you this morning. It just might be you. I think I'm talking to some people this morning that you're in that position. You've tried everything and nothing's worked. And you've prayed and you've, and you've sought God and you've fasted and you've done some things, but nothing's happened yet. But I believe today is the day that something good is going to happen. I really believe that with all my heart. God gave me this message because he said there's something going to happen today. Maybe you suffered a long time illness. Maybe you have suffered a long time with the same sin issue and you've prayed it through and you've been through deliverance, but it still keeps cropping up in your heart. It still keeps cropping up in your mind. You think God wouldn't ever get victory over this. Maybe it's an addiction. You thought this addiction was gone. You, you did away with it many years ago and all of a sudden it just comes back like that. And you think, God, how does this happen? And you're desperate today to get out of that addiction that you've allowed to, to, to stay in your life and haunt you and bring embarrassment to your life and cause you to spend money that you didn't have. Amen? So God wants you, God wants you free today. He wants me free today from anything that is, that is hampering us and keeping us and enjoying the fruit and, and the life that God has called us to live and to advance the kingdom of God with power. When you look at Luke 8, 44, it says, Pressing in through the crowd. Say, pressing in. Pressing in through the crowd, she came up behind Jesus and touched the tassel of his prayer shawl. Instantly, her bleeding stopped, and she was healed. Mark 5.27 says this. When she heard about Jesus' healing power, she pushed through. Say, pushed through. She pushed through the crowd, and she came up from behind him. There's a reason she came up from behind him. And touched his prayer shawl, for she kept saying to herself, If I can only touch his clothes, I know I will be healed. Pressing in, pushing in. She wasn't thinking about, I'm going to offend somebody. I wonder what they're going to say. She said, I've got to get there. Now, there was a humiliation. Desperation sometimes causes us to be humbled or humiliated in that sense. Because she, and when she pushed through the crowd, she knew the, the repercussions that could come if nothing really happened. She could be ostracized for the rest of her life. They could look, they could look at, what are you doing here, woman? We know who you are. She was risking something to get in there and push in. But she came from behind because I don't think she wanted Jesus to see her face to face because she didn't know him yet. And Jesus, if she saw him face to face, she might have thought, well, he, he's going to know me and he's going to tell me to get behind, get away from me. You're unclean. She didn't know what to expect except I'm coming from behind. I want to sneak up on Jesus. <laughs> you ever snuck up on Jesus? She says, I just get up there and touch the tassel 
of that, of that prayer shawl, I know I'm going to be healed. Now, we're going to talk about the prayer shawl. I want Ms. Dr. Seal to come up, and I want Nate to come up. And we're going to demonstrate, we're going to talk about this prayer shawl because it's very important what happened that day. And we want you, I want you to understand what was going through her mind when she came up to touch the hem of his garment, okay? This is the priest's shirt prayer shawl, and it's used also for the for a hoopah, if they were for a wedding. But this is the names of God. There's a prayer that's prayed when they kiss it and they hold it up to God. When I put it on his head, it will come down on his shoulders, but as long as it's on his head, it can be that prayer room. So, Nate, I put it on you and wrap it around. So I was, I was in Israel, and everybody wants a prayer shawl. And I think I've had no telling how many, but I've kept, held on to this one because Sister Ruth said, this is yours, and I want you to have it because it's blue. So I started doing the research about the blue. It's so important. At one time before I wore it out, there was blue on the ZZs, but I've, I've used it so many times and wrapped it around my fingers, and so it's gone now. But I'm telling you, just that little thread, just this cloth doesn't mean anything. But when we give whatever we have to the Lord, when we dedicate it to the Lord, that's when it means something. Here's the names of God. He has the names of God on his head. And on his shoulders, he carries the weight of who God is. And then these are the commandments and the promises of God. The commandments of God are yes and amen. And he doesn't change. Now, did you feel anything when I put the prayer shawl on you? Peace. Peace. Most everyone, Pastor, tells me that they feel something or even smell something because of the fragrance of the Lord. Thank you. Let's give Nada and, and Sandra a hand. <laughs> I thought it would be better if you could actually see it uh, instead of just me talking about it. Um, so this lady's coming. She's trying. She wants to. She said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment or the tassel or the seat. Titi, uh, uh, the, the, the prayer shawl itself is called a talit. And so he said, she said, if I can just touch that. Now, wonder why she would say it that one particular thing, if I could just touch the hem of his garment or the fringe. Well, she may have been referring to an Old Testament prophet, prophet Malachi. In Malachi 4.2, and I'm going to read from the Amplified, it says, But for you who fear my name with an all-filled reverence, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forward and leap joyfully. And I, that to me, that if you're healed, you're going to leap joyfully, and like calves released from the stall. You see that word in, in, in the, the word wing there. Also in Hebrew, also means fringe. And so they maybe that lady she knew the prophetic word, and she said, if I can just touch the hem to that, that if I can just get a hold of that fringe, because I know he is the son of righteousness, and I will be healed. She wanted to have a point of contact. Jesus' garment was a point of contact for this woman. A lot of people go, what do you mean a point of contact? Well, if you go to Acts chapter 19, we see that the Apostle Paul had points of contact, handkerchiefs and aprons that he had had worn on his body. And somehow, some way, we don't know that, how it happened, but somebody took one of those handkerchiefs one time and that apron one time, and they laid it on somebody that's sick because Paul couldn't get there possibly. They said, well, this was from Paul. Lay it on him, and that person got healed. It says, it says God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were bought from his body to the sick and the diseases left him and the evil spirits went out of them it's a point of contact some people with that just that just sounds silly i'm telling you it's not silly it's in the word of god we have we have a ministry here called prayer coverings and you we have we have given away literally hundreds of prayer blankets and people call and they say, my, so, my uncle is sick or so-and-so has cancer. And we've heard that you have a prayer covering ministry. And we have these sacks that we have beautiful scriptures on them. And we go and buy these blankets and, and, we, and we anoint them with oil. When the prayer team prays over them, the, the intercessors pray over them. And listen, we're not, we're not superstitious. It's not hokey pokey. It's a point of contact. And we've had... Testimony after testimony after testimony of people saying, man, I, when I put that blanket on, I felt such peace. I felt the presence of God. And there are some people, listen, they won't let go of those blankets. 
Man, I don't even know if they'll even wash them. I don't know. But they, they hang on to these blankets and say, they say this means so much because it's a tangible representation of the presence of God. Just like when we take the bread and we drink the cup, we, we're, it's a tangible representation of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. We need a point of contact, church. But here's the deal. The greatest point of contact, it's not an apron. It's not a handkerchief. It's not a, it's not a prayer shawl. It, it's, it's not a prayer blanket. It's you and me. We are the point of contact. Let me tell you why. He said that we would lay our hands on the sick. We would lay our hands on the sick and they would recover. A point of contact. Let me read the scripture for you. Mark 16, 17. And these miracle signs will accompany those who believe. They will drive out demons in the power of my name. They will speak in tongues. They will be supernaturally protected from snakes and from drinking anything poisonous. And they will lay hands on the sick and heal them. To me, that's a commandment. I don't know about to you, but it's, to me, it's a commandment. He said the greater works that we would do that he did. He said that we're going to go and do, we're going to make disciples. We're going to teach them all things that he commanded us to teach. And we're going to teach them to others. And we're going to replicate ourselves and duplicate ourselves. Because I can't go and touch everybody. Mary Lou can't go and touch everybody. Ed and Latoni can't go and touch everybody. we got to all be out there laying hands on the sick. But if you don't believe that the point of contact is important, then you won't, you won't see anything happen. Mark. Uh, Luke 8, 44 says, pressing in through the crowd. I've already read this once. I want to read it again. Pressing in through the crowd, she came up behind Jesus and touched the tassel of his prayer shawl. And instantly her bleeding stopped and she was healed. Remember, the second thing, and we're, we're just moving right into it, is desperation leads to deliverance. Desperation leads to deliverance. When it says that she was healed, the Greek word there is sozo. S-O-Z-O. And that sozo word has many meanings. One of them is deliverance, but it also means safe and sound. It means healed. It means made whole. It means rescued. It means restored. It means saved. It, that's what Jesus does for the body. That's what Jesus does today. He is not, he's not some God of the past. I used to do that. You know what? I'm tired of doing that. I can't do that anymore. My powers of all, they're gone. No, no, he is the God of today. People that say he doesn't heal anymore, I don't know where they get that. I, I just That seems almost blasphemy to, blasphemous today to say that Jesus doesn't heal anymore, that he doesn't do any miracles anymore. And, oh, I'm just, you know, just going to try to get in the way. Maybe he'll touch me. Maybe not. I don't know. It says this in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus, the anointed one, is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean, always the same, that he never changes? So you can hang on to the promises of yesterday because those promises are good for today. And according to the thinking of that day, when, when an unclean woman would have touched Jesus, it would have made him unclean. Isn't that amazing, though? That when she touched him, not only did she become clean, he never did become unclean. That's the power of God. That's the love of God. That's the character of God. That's the nature of God. That's how it works, church. When she touched his garment, Jesus was, he wasn't made unclean. She was made sozo, whole, delivered, healed, restored. See, when we come to Jesus with our sin and we lay it on him, he doesn't become a sinner. He doesn't become a sinner. We become clean. That's how it works. That's how Jesus works. This woman literally, listen, she pushed through the crowd to get to Jesus there's a great acronym for PUSH. Pray until something happens. Pray. That, that's pressing in, church. Some of us, we don't want to pray until something happens. We want to pray and hope something happens if we pray a little sweet prayer. And God says, we, I want you to press in in your prayer life. I want you to press in in your belief system. I want you to press in into what you're believing that God's going to do for you today. Are you pressing in? Or are you just kind of wishy-washy? you just kind of haphazardly praying once in a while? Or are you pressing in for that, for that miracle that you need, for that change, that, that, that transformation you need? Or are you pressing in for it? Sometimes we just kind of get lazy, don't we? And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, and we go back to that, case, sera, sera, it's just not going to happen, it wasn't meant for me. Listen, that is the lazy man's theology. That's a lazy way to think. God wants us to press in today. Why do, you tell, why do you think he gave us that example of that woman pressing through the crowd? With all these other people around and couldn't even, probably couldn't even hardly see him. And she said, I'm getting in there. 
Are you, are you desperate enough to go after Jesus today? Are you desperate enough to go after what he has for you today? Don't stop short of it. Don't just pray up until something almost happens and, and it doesn't happen. You give up. Keep praying it through. That's called supplication. Pray through. Pray until something happens. Verse 45 of Luke 8 says this. Jesus suddenly stopped. I love this. He stopped and he said to his disciples, Someone touch me. Who is it? Well, they all denied it. <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't do it. <laughs> Can you just imagine how these guys acted sometimes? Peter pointed out, uh, <clears throat> this is the way I would interpret that, Ed. He would go, <clears throat> uh, Master, there's a lot of people here. <laughs> and a lot of people have touched you. Don't you know that? <laughs> but it's what he said. Master, everyone's touching you. Everybody's trying to get close to you. The crowds are so thick, we can't walk through all these people without being jostled. It's almost comical. He's like, okay. He raises the dead. He heals the sick. He causes the blind to see. But he didn't know who touched him. That, wh what? So I'm asking myself this question. Why did he ask that question? And here's the conclusion I believe that the Lord gave me. Because Jesus was always teaching his disciples. He always took opportunities. A good teacher will find opportunities to teach, won't they? And so he asked them this question that he already knew the answer to, right? And this is what I believe he was saying to them. There are faithless touches and there are faith-filled touches. There are people that pretend to touch me or they don't have an expectation when they touch me. They're just going through the motions when they touch me. Or they're just offering up a, I'm just going to offer up a little prayer. And there's no faith involved in that touch. There's no faith involved in that prayer. There's no digging in. There's no pressing in. Well, I've got to hear from Jesus. I've got to touch him. He's got to give me an answer. I need healing. I need this. I need that. There are faithless touches all in the all in the church today. People are just offering up these little prayers. Oh, Lord, just wipe out the coronavirus. Thank you, Jesus. And then we go on about our daily deal, whatever it is, or isolation or our, our non-touching, whatever it is. And we just kind of go through life and we flitter through life without faith to move mountains. He said if we have faith, we can move a mountain. So I think he's trying to get them. Guys, I know there are people touching me. You got, you're missing it. But there was one. There was one that really touched me with faith. You know how I know that, guys? Because it, it, the healing power came out of my body. He felt it. You know what it's like when you're praying, when you're praying a faith-filled prayer. You feel it. But when you're just going through the motions, God is good, God is great, let us thank Him for this food. Why did I, I got it backwards, didn't I? God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for the food. Amen. <whistles> Pass the biscuits. You know, God, I'm, I, I really don't feel good. Would you touch my body? Thank you. I'm going to work. And then you pop a bottle, you know, get, get your pills and take them and go on. We don't press in. And then we don't see God move. And then we wonder, why didn't you move, God? I prayed. He said, that was a faithless touch. That was a faithless touch. Sometimes we need to start, well, we just need to start praying and recognizing that God wants to do something. We need to start praying with an expectation. I'm telling you, that day she was expecting. It said, listen, she said in the scriptures, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. I will be made whole. Now, that's faith. That's faith that she reached out and touched Jesus with. She touched the master with purpose. She touched the Messiah with expectation. Again, Luke 8, 46, said, Jesus said, replied, I have felt power surge through me. Someone touched me to be healed, and they received their healing. Luke 8, 47 says, And when the woman realized she couldn't hide any longer, she came and fell trembling at Jesus' feet. Before the entire crowd, she declared, I was what? Desperate. Say desperate. She said, I was desperate to touch you, Jesus, for I knew if I could just touch even the fringe of your robe, I would be healed. I just don't know. You know, I, I think, why don't we see a move of God like we want to see a move of God or we say we want to see a move of God? 
I think it's because we're not desperate. We fill our lives with all other things. It's kind of like you've got this great meal waiting for you, but before you get to that great meal, you go through the drive-thru and, and get a couple of Big Macs and you ruin your appetite. You try to fill it with something that's not really good. Well, you might like them. But. And then you miss the great meal, the meal that heals. We need to go after God with purpose. We need to go after Him with expectation. I, I think about... This woman, let's go back and think about her life. Twelve years. Didn't say how old she was. Twelve years. She'd been going through this agony and this suffering. Twelve years of embarrassment. Twelve years of spending every dime she had on doctors. Twelve years of hiding. Twelve years of being in shame and guilt. And all in one moment, say one moment, in one moment, Expecting to be healed by the Master. She was healed. In one moment. Her life changed dramatically in one moment. Listen, when you come, listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in one moment, your life can go from a, a direction that's headed to a devil's hill to eternity in heaven. In one moment. In one moment, you can go from being sick to being healed. In one moment, you can go from being an addiction to being free from an addiction. In one moment, you can, be go, you can go from being caught up in sin to being released and free from sin, from the power of sin. In one moment. That's how powerful my God is. One moment. Here's the thing, though. It says she came at when she... When, I can just imagine when Jesus turned around and said, There you are. It said she came and fell at his feet. You know what that's in, that to me it pictures? Worship. Thankfulness. Oh God. I've been waiting for this moment for 12 years. And she just bowed at his feet and worshipped him. And declared her faith in him. I want you to see three, three things here in, in these next three verses. It's the same verse. It's been three different looks at it okay Luke 8 48 listen to this Jesus responded to her when she fell down at his feet beloved daughter your faith in me has released your healing you may go with me with my peace Mark 5 34 then Jesus said to her daughter because you dared to believe your faith has healed you Go with peace in your heart and be free from your suffering. In Mark 5, 34, in the message, Jesus said to her, Daughter, you took a risk of faith, and now you're healed and whole. Live well. Live blessed. Be healed of your plague. The third thing I want you to see this morning is desperation leads to daring to believe. Desperation leads, leads to daring to believe. That's what she did. She took a risk. She... she, she we already saw what she went through to get to, to Jesus and all the things that could have happened. And she said, I don't care. None of that matters. I'm going to get to Jesus today. I've heard he's in town. I want to touch. He's gonna, I'm going to be healed today. And here's what he responded to. He never called anybody else this. This is the only time, if, if, if my commentaries are correct, this is the only time he ever addressed one, a person like this. He called her daughter. He called her beloved daughter. Wow, coming from the lips of Jesus, beloved daughter. Only time. He says this, your faith in me has released your healing because you dared to believe and you took a risk of faith. You see, faith is risky. Faith is trusting. Faith is, 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 is letting it all hang out. Faith is saying, I don't care what this person thinks. I don't care what that person thinks. I'm going after God. I don't care what, if they think I'm a fanatic, that's okay. I'm a fanatic for Jesus. I don't think if they, if they think I'm crazy, I'm crazy for, for Christ. I don't care what people think about me. I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm going to press in. I'm going to go, I'm going to press forward. I'm going to go after what he has for me. Listen, the, the time of apathy should be over. The time that we've been saying, oh, this, this virus thing, the church is waking up. I don't know if the church is going to wake up. I don't know when we get to come back if people are going to be scared to come back. I don't know what's going to happen. I would pray that, that whatever the enemy has meant for bad, God's going to turn it for good. I know we're reaching a lot of people through live stream and Facebook, but there's something about connecting here and touching one another. I'm going to need to touch somebody.
It's not in my notes. See, pressing in requires faith. Forsaking all, I trust Him. I know that's a tough one. Forsaking that all part is the tough part. Forsaking all, I trust Him. That means we take a risk. We take a leap. We get out of our comfort zone. We believe for the impossible. We stand on the Word of God instead of our experiences. We stand on the Word instead of, Oh, well, it didn't happen for me. I prayed it didn't happen. Well, guess what? Pray again. Pray until something happens. Well, I, I thought I touched him in his garment. Well, go after him again. I, I know there's healing in his wings. Well, get under his wings. He's just waiting for us to do something that causes us to step outside of ourselves in our humanity and in our flesh into the spirit realm, into the, the, the realm of the Holy Spirit where he says, I can do all things through you. I can do this if you will just trust me. And there's nothing that is too hard for God. His hands, his arms aren't too short. Nothing's impossible for him. Taking a risk sometimes means you have no backup plan. No parachute. You just jump. Say, God, I'm trusting you to catch me. No backup plan. It's all or nothing. No turning back. You know you can do that with God. You say, God, I, I, you're it. I've tried everything else. You're it. Matter of fact, let's try him first. Instead of leaving him as the backup plan. Let's go after him first. And I'm not talking about just for the big things. Let's go after him first for the little things. Oh, God, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I, I've been laid off. Well, go after God. And you said, he said he would provide all your needs. Go to him first. God, you know, I, I've, I've said this. Uh, through the years, uh, when we, when I, I look at the the giving and, and I'm, you know I look at it every week, and there have been times when I I would they would print out the giving and our budget and how much we had in the bank. <laughs> and there were some times when there was very 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 little in the bank, and my first fleshly thought would be, Oh God, <laughs> what are we gonna do? And almost instantaneously, I'm not saying always, but almost instantaneously it would be like God go, hey, 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 Harold, it's in your deal, this is mine. Didn't I tell you I'd take care of you? Yes, God. Then why are you worried about it? I'm not God, this is yours. Did you know that we've never, ever, ever, ever not paid bills? We've never been in, in debt? Because God says, this is my ministry. You just be faithful and you trust me. But sometimes that little inkling, you, know, you ever get that like fear? Oh, no. God says, no, immediately take that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's what all of you are going to have to do. Some of you out there this morning, you're like, I don't know where the next meal is coming. Listen, you give that. To, you, God said he would provide your needs. If he can multiply five loaves of bread and two fish to feed 10,000 people, I think he can take care of your family. If you just trust him. The Apostle Paul, listen, I want to finish with a couple of with a couple of my favorite verses that talk about pressing in. And then we're going to talk about some a couple of more things and we'll close. In Philippians 3.12, listen, if that's not highlighted in your Bible, it should be. Philippians 3.12 says, Not that I, this is the Apostle Paul, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Say press on. That I may lay hold. Say lay hold. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He's got you, okay? Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Say one thing. He said, I forget those things which are behind, reaching forward. Say reaching forward. Hope you are talking it up in your den, okay? To those things which are ahead. He said, I'm not going to dwell on the past. I am going to press on. I'm going to reach forward. I'm going to go forward. I am going to press into... Those things which are ahead. He says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That word press on here, or the press forward, means to, as one is running a race, running it swiftly. Paul always talked about in terms of race. He said, I've, I've, I've kept the faith. I have finished my race. We're in a race, and that's part of the pressing in. We don't have time to stop and coast. We gotta keep pressing in if we're gonna see God do what He wants to do. If we're gonna if we're gonna trust Him for the miracles and the signs and the wonders, which we say we believe that He does, we need to see them more and more and more. Amen. To 
to truly press into something, this is the part most people don't really care for. There are things that we have to set aside or give up. Yeah, now, preacher, you done ruined that sermon. It was a good sermon up to then. I mean, I'm just thinking about the, the, the COVID-19 thing we're going through. Our whole country set aside through economy to attack this, to try to get a victory over it. Set it aside, and, and look what it's doing to our country. And so I'm looking at that, I'm going, well, the God, if what do we need to set aside to see victory? What do, you, what do you need to set aside? What, what, is, what is dominating your life that's keeping you from pressing into the things of God? Because there are things that dominate people's lives and get in the way of people's lives. You can be so fearful right now, you can be so con uh, focused on the coronavirus that you can't see God through it. And he would say, you need to lay that aside. I've got you covered. You think that mass is going to cover you? I've got you covered. I'll put a guard over your mouth. That's Scripture. And we trust in the, so many of the wrong things, church. And we're not willing sometimes to set aside the things that keep us from pressing in and receiving everything God has for us. Today is the day to press in. I wrote this down this morning. The Lord gave me this. Today is the day to press into the present and to press into His presence. He says, I'm, I'm not going backwards. I'm going, I'm, I want to be right here, right now. He's speaking to you right now. Right now. I want to finish with this scripture, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is what he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run. There's that pressing in. Let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus did the very thing for us that he's asking us to do for him. He set aside his glory. He set aside his divinity. He set aside his majesty. And he left heaven to come to earth. He set aside, he was humiliated on the cross. He was beaten and bruised for our sins. And he said, I'm going to do all this because of the joy. You are the joy that is set before me. I'm going to do this for you, but now I want you, if you're going to press in and receive everything I have for you, I want you to do the same thing. You die to yourself. You start pressing in. You start laying aside those things that are hampering your Christian walk, that are hampering you from getting everything that God has for you. Because I'm telling you, church, we're living way beneath the means that God has for us. He wants us to live the abundant life. I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel. I'm talking about living the abundant life. That means that we're so blessed that we can't keep the blessings. We've got to give them away. I'm, I'm talking about you, you have so much healing in your hands that you want to give it away. You want to go pray for people. And even if you don't experience and see the manifestation of it right then, you're not going to give up. You're going to keep praying. You're going to pray until something happens. What are you desperate for today? What are you willing to lay aside to receive your deliverance? What are you willing to risk today to see your life changed? And healing to take place. As I was praying last night, I was asking the Lord, Who am I speaking to today, Lord? And He said, Well, He said, There's somebody out there cutting, cutting themselves. And it may not, it may not be a you who I'm talking to you right now, maybe somebody you know, maybe a one of your children. There's somebody out there cutting themselves because they hate their life. Their thoughts of suicide. And I'm asking, are you desperate enough that you want your life back? That you want the joy of the Lord? And you're going to have to press in. You're going to have to press in. We've got a prayer line this morning. And I know some of you may have been hesitant to call in. But we do really want to pray for you. I've got, I've got, man, I've got a prayer warrior in there in the office right now. Elder Ed Sutton is in there waiting by the phone. 
If you call 227-4121, he is going to pick up right now. And he wants to pray for you. But this is what I want to take place. And we have the other number up there. This is what I want to take place this morning. There are godly people in your group right now. In your circle right now. And there's needs there right now that somebody needs a touch from God. And you're going to be the point of contact. You're going to be the one that comes and you're going to lay your hands on them. Dads, you might need to go lay your hands on your children. They may have some illness that you need to, you need to rebuke and you need to call in. You just need to press in right now and speak life over them. It may be a marriage. There are marriages that need healing today. And I believe today that that can take place. As you press in and say, God, I'm going to take a risk today. I'm going to tell my husband, I'm sorry. Or I want to tell my wife, I'm sorry. Would you please forgive me? When forgiveness starts, takes over in your household and, and the love of God starts coming in and healing and deliverance takes place today. Maybe hearts need to be healed today. Maybe, uh, maybe there just needs to be somebody to come to that place of, of restoration of their, of their family today. Will you be that point of contact today? Will you say, listen, if I can just touch the hem of God's garment, if I can just draw from Him because He, he is just waiting. He's just waiting to heal somebody today. He's waiting to touch somebody today. So would you do that right now? Would you be obedient? I'm going to pray and then we're going to, we're going to have an, a song, a, a healing song. But I don't want you to don't get up and run around the house. Listen, this is a serious time. I want you to really press in. So, Father, right now, in Jesus' name, help us to set aside all the things, all the cares of the world, all the worries and all the fears. Father, we just bind those up in Jesus' name and release faith in these homes. We release faith in the cars of the people that are listening or look, watching on their phones. Father, we release faith wherever people are right now. That they would come and they say, if I can just touch Jesus today. And maybe you're that person, that tangible representation that you're going to reach out and touch somebody. You're going to lay your hands on the sick. And they shall recover. And we're going to believe the Word of God. We're going to trust in Him. And we're going to take a risk today. Even if even it feels like, man, I, I don't know if I can do that. I'm not, I don't know if I'm equipped for that. I'm telling you to press in and say, God, with you, I can do this. I want to be, the, I want to be that contact person that sees healing take place in Jesus name would you call in if you need prayer as we sing this morning healing is here 